welcome to a edition, the first edition of Unscripted. And you're seeing lots of faces here. We're going to do some quick intros and talk about a new type of program. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm here with George, Catherine, Gavin, and Mark. And we're kind of mismatching Anglican Unscripted and Catholic Unscripted for an episode just to see how it goes and if there's fun things to talk about, and there are. So uh, this is Catholic Unscripted with a small C, not uh, a big C. That would do it. Both. Sure, sure. Both. You, okay. Yeah. And, and so uh, how is this going to happen? I don't know. How is it going to work? No idea. Is the Holy Spirit involved? I hope so. So let's no, do some quick. It, yeah, yeah. Let's do some quick intros. Uh, Catherine, give us a, a quick talk about yourself. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm a teacher and I work for the Diocese in Evangelization. I work with Catholic Voices in the UK, which was set up after Pope Benedict's 16th visit to the UK to help defend the church in, in the public square and in the media. And I write for the Catholic Herald and have been working with Gavin and Mark doing our Catholic Unscripted, um, which we set up about six months ago, following you guys. Uh, Gavin, you were the former chaplain to the Queen. You joined the Roman Catholic Church. Give us a quick update for those who have not been following you, what you've been up to. Well, there's almost nothing I haven't done that I haven't messed up. <laughs> and, but I've landed on my feet in the Catholic Church. I've I've become a, a Catholic apologist. Uh, like Mark and Catherine, I write in the Catholic Herald. Um, they're both hugely successful. You mustn't be. You mustn't um, buy their humility. They both have more theology degrees than you can shake a stick at, and um, and they're both hugely influential. So I'm very pleased that my friends were a kind of troublesome trio. And absolutely, we're we're following this highly successful successful and influential um, uh, initiative that that Kevin and George have started. So we're just hot on your tails, guys. How many episodes are you up to now? About 10. <laughs> You're doing fine. 13. I think we've done 13. 14, 14, Gavin. 14. 14. Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> but when people ask it, you got to know it. You can't guess it. Yeah. 14, 14, and 14. for our American viewers, do you now have heat in your chapel, Gavin? That was a, oh, an ongoing I issue. <laughs> I, it was an ongoing. I have a I have a wood burner. If I if I lift this up, this will probably destroy everything. But look look in the corner. Look at that. There it is. Oh, there ah, it is. Nice. Oh, I, no don't like Greta. Idea. Don't like Greta Thunberg. Like Greta. See that, Gavin, because your <laughs> your carbon footprint is expanding and exponentially. Well, it's it's just better than the nuclear waste. That's all I can say. <laughs> Mark, tell us about yourself. Well, I'm just part of this troublesome trio, I think. I like that description. I'm a Catholic blogger um, and a businessman, and I you know, I suppose I take my faith seriously, which uh, is unusual these days a little bit, isn't it? So I'm kind of uh, become a bit notorious in England um, and I'm made lots of contacts in the States and stuff. So, yeah, that's uh, it. causing trouble okay. wherever possible. So for the viewer, what do we mean by when we say unscripted? Unscripted means we don't really write down or read off scripts. We have some general topics. We do a little prayer, and we sit down and talk about them. Today, I put George in charge of topics, and uh, let's throw one off the top of our heads, George. What do you got? Benedict XVI, the most consequential for Anglicans, I believe, Pope of the, 20th, uh, the 21st century. Sure. Um, he, of course, he passed away within the last few weeks. Uh, he, uh, my introduction to him came from a Christmas gift from my daughter. One of my girls gave me the book "Jesus of Nazareth," his first book. I'd always known of him when he was uh, head of the CDF and a theologian and professor, and of course, Pope. I read his book, and I thought I got to go deeper. And I read the next two. And I started exploring, and I found this man to be a voice of sanity, of love. Uh, I, you know, when he, I remember his Regensburg address. Uh, and in other words, this was somebody who was so very attractive intellectually and spiritually. And he seemed a genuinely nice man. Now, because of my ignorance, I don't, there's no baggage for Cardinal Ratzinger or Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, for me, I just know the man from his writings and from how he's presented. But uh, personal anecdote: two thousand three, 
I was attending a conference of conservative Anglicans in Dallas, Texas, and he sent a letter that was read to the, the group. And as Joseph Ratzinger, head of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, which was so powerful, the Anglo-Catholics among us burst into tears. We evangelicals held our breath, held our noses and say, I guess we can accept this uh, being silly. But it really was an important affirmation because he greeted us as brothers and sisters in Christ. He gave us fraternal greetings. He gave us priestly greetings. He gave, he, this was an important time for Anglicans who felt they were being dispossessed by the national church in its pathway towards perdition. And to have him step in and intervene uh, was a remarkable thing. A few years later, he intervened to Rowan Williams' great, dis great dismay and started the ordinariate. So he's a double-edged sword, uh, but truly a remarkable man. And I, I firmly believe will be made a doctor of the church one day when sure. session time passes. Well, he first came on my radar uh, as a replacement to Pope John Paul II and worked many years and then announced that he's going to retire, that he did not want to uh, continue as Pope and move into an emeritus role. And I found that very surprising. I didn't even know that was an option. I thought for sure that uh, when you take on the role of Pope, you, you do that to your last heartbeat, so they take you off your ring and smash it. And I, it was interesting to watch him move into this new role uh, as the emeritus. And in that role, he was very silent in public. You did not see um, him challenging uh, any of the decisions by uh, Pope Francis or anything you would see in it another type of uh, a co-pope situation. And I thought that was very enjoyable. Uh, let's move on to, to Catherine. Well, I said before, when I think of Pope Benedict, I think of truth and love. Um, he was a really, really prophetic voice in the, in the church, a prophetic voice in the culture, and he spoke about the dictatorship of relativism. And we can see only too clearly now how um, relativism has taken hold and people have lost sight of what is true. And although we have, I said this before, although we have figures um, in the secular world and uh, such as Jordan Peterson who are talking about the importance of truth, what Benedict was able to do is to say, um, we can't just act as if something is true, that, 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 that truth is real, truth exists, and truth has a face. And it, it, is, it is about a personal encounter with truth, with truth, with Christ himself. So everything Benedict uh, wrote about, everything Benedict said, was always bringing us back to Christ, always bringing us back to truth itself, and uh, but always in love. And I think he had there was this false sort of narrative that came about, and we could see it before his visit to the UK, um, that he was this dogmatic conservative stuck in the mud. It was very negative, and in fact, what happened was he came over, and um, there was this outpouring of love. Uh, both towards him and from him. And anyone who heard him speak or, and read his writings would see that uh, that was at the heart of everything was love. And one of my uh, one of the one of the encyclicals he wrote called Deus Caritas Est is just profoundly beautiful and reminds us that when Jesus spoke about the most important commandment, which is to love God and love one another, that we really need to understand what we mean when we say love. And that's a word that's also so lost and so misunderstood in our culture. So he provided great clarity and rooted in Christ, rooted in truth itself, and reminds us that, that truth has a face and that we we have this encounter with Christ. Mark, Mark, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I miss him very much, if I'm honest. <laughs> um, he was perhaps one of the most influential figures in my own journey of faith. Um, and I would say that the defining sort of uh, the the leap motif of the papacy was faith and reason that he presented our faith in a very reasonable way, um, and he was able to um, explain it to people. He wasn't frightened of explaining. It wasn't in fright. He wasn't frightened of uh, taking on the, the the major shibboleths of our age, like relativism. Um, he spoke out against the problems that we're now seeing manifest in the German church. Um, but at the same time, 
he gave us Christ in, you know, when he was Pope, he gave us Christ in three volumes. He was all about showing us the face of Jesus. And I think he affected so many people, uh, just as George said. I've no doubt that we'll be reading his stuff in 100 years, 200 years. You know, we'll be picking over it, unlike Pope Francis. Uh, and Gavin, what are your thoughts? Hmm, I thought... I I'm so impressed by some of the things people have said already. How can I add to them? Well, uh, it was extraordinary that he had not only uh, an immensely intelligent head and was one of the premier theologians in the whole world, and and we forget that he was um, he was a sort of secretary for the Inquisition <laughs> or for the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, which is a role that involves defending the integrity of the faith. And who was he defending it against? He was defending it against all the guys we're fighting at the moment, all the progressives. Um, and he did it. He did it with with immense skill and faithfulness. But then, when he became pope, we discovered, as people have said, that he had a, a his heart as big as his head, and and he did this incredible thing of showing Jesus to us. Um, and I think ecumenically, that's going to be wonderful because we 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 all Anglicans and Catholics carry false narratives about each other in our in our heads and in our baggage. And one of the things, maybe one of the things, will come out of our conversation here. If it did, it'd be very valuable would be to expose where the narratives are false. And there's, there's a false narrative that Catholics aren't born again. They don't love Jesus with all their heart, whereas actually um, the Catholic Church is responsible for converting the whole of Europe with just empty-handed saints who love Jesus passionately. And that hasn't changed. I mean, the, the 18th century, was it, was it was all Catholic evangelization around the world. 19th century, the, the evangelicals did a fantastic job and caught up and maybe overtook us. And so we should be racing each other for evangelism. But Benedict had the effect of being a, evangelist par excellence because he loved Jesus so much. And I'd just like to say one more thing about the the ordinariat. Um it looks like it might be competition to to um it's Rowan Williams, but uh, as the coalition of churches that is Anglicanism is breaking up, um the the need to be there need to be places uh, in the Protestant end where people can flee to that are safe and faithful and, and they're there and people are looking them out. But there also needs to be a place at the other end, Mother Church, the home church, which and it needs to be seen as being safe and faithful. And one of the things Benedict did was to give a route back so we could take the most beautiful things in Anglicanism, the most beautiful prayers and liturgy, and find a home back, rooted back in the Mother Church. Benedict made that possible. And for that, I think a lot of people will be very grateful to him. I think that's and important. He stands to... Go ahead. I was thinking he stands on the work of John Paul II, especially, you know, from my limited readings of his John Paul's writings on the body and the human. And in other words, there's a progression there that builds upon what came before and not just in building a tower against all attackers, which which one of its strengths is that it is very strong, but rather it was welcoming, not threatening. In the United States, we have a history of anti-Catholic bigotry. It's been around since the very beginning, and it's basically related to immigration and all this and that. And it only started to collapse with a man named Fulton J. Sheen in the 50s. And if you will, the next iteration, in my mind, what Fulton J. Sheen made Catholicism in the United States not foreign. It made it loving, it kind, evangelical, all the things that Gavin just mentioned. Uh, Joseph Ratzinger, now I'm speaking within Protestant circles, uh, Joseph Ratzinger's work was at a time when people like Richard John Newhouse in the United States uh, were basically coming to Catholic writer, uh, thinker, were coming together with conservative Protestants in common cause, which had never really happened before. It was always, you know, we go your way, you go ours. And Joseph Ratzinger really became along and it was almost the cement that glued these two things that were sort of growing side by side all these years. We'll recognize you as respectable, but we're not going to borrow from you. But now when Ratzinger came on the scene, what I saw in my 30 plus years being an Episcopalian was that we would start taking things from his work and not saying it, well, this is a Catholic import, therefore I've got to be particularly frightened I don't get cooties or something, but rather this really is speaks to God's will for uh, 
all his creation. Um, I, I remember. And of uh, course, the Anglo Catholics watching will be really mad because, of course, we've been doing this for 100 years. Yeah, but nobody pays attention to you. So, yeah. Um, well, in his first homily, uh, um, Pope Benedict referred to, get this straight here, um, some of uh, Pope John Paul's teachings. And he, he kind of opened up and said, uh, Do not be afraid, open wide the doors of Christ. And I think it's interesting because he wanted to take on uh, a messaging from Joe, uh, uh, Pope John Paul and uh, was able to do so by including his own friendship with Christ. You know, many of his sermons and preaching were around the, the essence of the friendship of Jesus. And uh, that was, I'm not going to say unique, but it was certainly new in this, this century uh, for Roman, Roman Catholicism. If if I could ask my Catholic brethren on this on this broadcast, why was why this sort of downplaying of Benedict? I mean, you know, the the, fun, the, the funeral sermon was pretty bad. I mean, it, you know, I could have given that. It will, I probably copy it and give it to the next person I don't know when I bury. It was, you know, there's nothing about Benedict. It was just an off the shelf funeral sermon. Uh, there's no sense that a giant has passed. Um, and in some of the content comments we've made gotten on Anglican Unscripted, I'm a Catholic and he did this and he did that and he covered up this and he was a member of the, uh, the Hitler Youth and fought, you know, all this vitriol coming from Catholic circles uh, towards him that I don't understand. And why the officialdom seems to want him to be forgotten and hidden away. Maybe that's just uh, my sort of uh, cranky well, view I'm of sure. things, but uh, has, a, has that struck anybody? Yeah. Why did four million people show up for John Paul and not so many for Benedict? Well, I think first thing to say is that he didn't die as, as Pope. So we do still have a Pope and there is, wouldn't, won't be an immediate enclave after his death. So it's a it's a unique situation. Um, so in, in, Pope Francis is obviously the, our Holy Father and uh, and Pope Benedict died em emeritus. So that's why it w wasn't as big an affair as the as Pope John Paul II. But I think the the um, what you were saying about Catholics speaking about his Hitler youth and uh, these things, well, this is because, um, like so many people, you you only they only look so far. They 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 they're swept up and caught up in uh, the false narrative and the false reporting, and taking little bits and pieces and they often just want they want to hear what, what they want to hear what fits their their thinking so they have to dig much deeper for the truth and of course that requires effort and many people don't wish to do that so that um i think that's probably why you hear that in catholic circles but you know you also hear in catholic circles people calling for uh, the right to have an abortion and so on which is obviously against the teaching of the church so there has always been and there always will be People who um, Catholics. say say that they say that they're Catholic, but don't uh, assent to the truth of the church, as you'll get in all walks of life. But what happens, which is difficult, is I think people then use that and say, so for example, in the past, some Catholic thinkers um, supported slavery, but the church never did. But because some Catholic thinkers said. Um, spoke on this uh, people then say all oh, the church supported slavery just like today if some if some catholic lay people say we support a woman's right to choose they'll say oh the catholic church supports abortion well the church itself doesn't but what you have is people who who refuse to to acknowledge what is true who refuse to assent to the truth and and to be honest refuse to do the work it takes to understand the beauty goodness and truth of the faith it's it's uh laziness on on their part i would say Mark. But the, the repudiation of Benedict was much more focused and deliberate. Mark, you, I'm sure you could speak to that with, with more skill about the way in which Francis set about that. repudiating there's a great There's a great uh, Catholic commentator on YouTube called Brian Holdsworth. Um, it's well worth looking up. He did a really good video about this. And uh, what he was saying was that uh, 
Benedict was the Pope of his conversion when he converted to Catholicism, and he found that the press were reporting consistently this, exactly as you said, George, you know, exactly like this sort of narrative about Benedict. And at that time, he was very engaged with reading what Benedict was writing and paying attention to what he was saying. And he just found the two things were completely different. That what the, that the what the press was saying was completely different from what he was reading from the man himself. And part of that is because we've become so used to secondhand sources, haven't we? We don't go to first-hand sources anymore. We look things up on Wikipedia. If we want to know what Augustine taught, we look it up on Wikipedia, we read a couple of lines, and there you go, we're experts on Augustine. And I think that um, the press were desperately pushing this narrative that he was uh, the Panzer Pope and all this stuff. But anyone who's read with any familiarity with any of his stuff knows that it was uh, far more uh, nuanced and intellectual and just absolute. I mean, just all of it was dripping with gold as far as, I, I mean, I'm looking, I'm saying that nostalgically, you know, because obviously what we've got now, it's just completely different. But Mark, you, you also said, which I thought was interesting, is that what Benedict did was he challenged this sort of, it was around about the time as these, new atheists and he he frightened the establishment who were so sure of their position and suddenly he came along and was so reasonable and and presented truth in a reasonable way in a, an authoritative way that actually i think that a lot of people were frightened by that and so the media wanted to present him in this way Did, what... well rowan williams uh, gave an interview to america magazine i don't know if any of you have seen that um which was brilliant he and uh, in that interview the guy from America magazine. So this is exactly what you're talking about, George. Right? He's a Catholic, the, the America magazine editor, and he's trying to get Rowan Williams to say, yeah, what a mean old Pope he was, you know. And Rowan Williams isn't having a bar of it. He's saying the bloke was a genius, you know, he was absolutely brilliant, an intellectual giant that we all... And, you know, even talking about the ordinary position, uh, Williams was able to see that what, what Benedict was doing was offering sucker to... The, you know, he was. It, people were in a difficult situation in England. They weren't getting any help from the hierarchy over here, and he was able to build that bridge to allow them to feel that they were welcomed into the, you know, the the church, which was just extraordinary. One of the best things he said in that interview, I thought, was, and I would encourage everyone. You can look it up on the Vatican website, but um, the address that he gave in Westminster Hall, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, was jaw dropping. And Rowan Williams said he was stand he was standing next to the speaker when Benedict gave that uh, speech, and that um, at the, the, the speaker had a, a, a prepared response. And as he spoke, he could see their jaw drop, and they just put aside the prepared response and just spoke to what he said because it was what he said. It moved everyone in the room, and that was what he was like. He was very quiet, but what he said carried such intellectual weight. And exactly as you were saying, Catherine, he terrified people because, you know, he was able to he was able to explain what's going on, to diagnose the situation in Christian terms in such a, a way that was uh, you weren't able to argue against it, really. And I think that really made people like the politicians in the UK at that point really think about what they were doing. Well, you have to remember America is a Jesuit magazine, and uh, yes. it's the United States. The Jesuits have been the I ones know. with the knives <laughs> firmly planted between his shoulders. Yeah. Uh, well, there we well, go. And, and, you know, they're obviously pushing uh, a particular narrative at the moment, you know, which is probably, you know, it's, I was raised by Jesuit. Uh, like I went to a Jesuit school, so I'm well aware of the Jesuit tricks being played at the moment. <laughs> well, one of the important things about Benedict is he knew who the enemy was. He called it the dictatorship of relativism. And you can find that in critical race theory, you find it in uh, first century Gnosticism. And uh, so knowing the enemy has re really helped Benedict, but it also helped that he could communicate that as well. Yavin, what do you think about that? Well, that's right. And the, the progressives hate it. So we have the same civil war in the Catholic Church as you're having in the Anglican Church. And perhaps as a quick preface, it might be worth saying there are two ways of doing history. I mean, one is a chronological way of saying this is how the developments took place and we can trace the denominations and their spectrum of belief across those things. And that's the way most of us have learned our history. 
But there's another way of doing history as Christians, which is to use the Holy Spirit to try and to, to discern not chronology so much as quality, authenticity, apostolicity maybe. And this is the point where Catholic is conscripted and Anglican unscripted. We're doing the same thing. We're tracing the the, the integrity and the apostolicity uh, of the Holy Spirit in our churches. And we're trying to, well, we're, we're, we're trying to expose heresy and, and what it does. Now, the reason, one of the reasons, the, one of the answers to George's very important question was that we we have a pope who is who appears to be on the side of the heretics uh, and and he's very uncomfortable with benedict for, because you would expect somebody who was on the progressive side of this terrible civil war that we're having across the globe you'd expect him to be very uncomfortable both with benedict and john paul and francis was and that's where the rudeness came in he couldn't restrain his antipathy and and the rudeness expressed itself in his refusal to let him to a cortege to have the, the thing so early no one could get to it in the morning um and to, to hardly mention benedict at all francis was really pissed off with benedict um and uh uh, so, the, so what we're seeing is the antipathy of of true faith and and people immersed in the Holy Spirit against people who are touched by the other Spirit and are really a bit cross about it. And what we're trying to do, I think, is to um, exactly the same: this act of discernment. Where is the Holy Spirit? Where is Jesus uh, and the truth of the Church and the Gospel in our communities? And who are the people who are screwing it up and masking it? Uh, so Benedict was one of the very best guys. Uh, perhaps it's just fitting oh, that yeah. I, I would just say perhaps it's just fitting Rowan Williams was paired with Benedict and Justin Welby has been paired with Francis. Yeah. Um, uh, but I understand. Justin Wibbly, as we like to call him. <laughs> Wibbly, Wibbly, Archbishop, Wibbly. <laughs> Archbishop Gishwain, uh Benedict's secretary's book comes out today in Italian. So as soon as, and evidently he's going to share all and tell all. Um, and one of the things he had said in the interviews ahead of time was that this uh, Benedict had no problem with Francis. It was Benedict's people and Francis's people who were at loggerheads. Benedict really got on with everybody. Um, he wouldn't say he wouldn't reciprocate and say that about Francis. But I'd be interested to see when this book comes out in English what he has to say about all the machinations around getting uh, Benedict out of office, forcing him out, not forcing him out, but persuading him that perhaps uh, uh, it was time to uh, move to Florida and uh, join all the other people, retirees here. There's a few interesting things you could say about that. I think one of the things was that he seemed to be a bit of a hypochondriac by all accounts, you know, Benedict. He was, when he, re when he retired, he was absolutely convinced that he was about to die within 12 months. So I've heard that from several people. Um, and then he was quite surprised that he lived for another 10 years. Um, the other thing is that famous statement where he said that his authority ends at the threshold of his office. So he was so he he was so humble, I think, is if I'm honest, I think that's what it was, humility, that he didn't see that his uh, writing or authority, that he didn't see that he had on any authority. And Pope Francis is the opposite. He's like a South American dictator. He's just going around throwing his weight around, you know, and, I mean, Gavin had a really interesting conversation with um, one of the, uh, the EWTM Rome correspondent who's an absolutely real great guy, Edward Pentin, um, on the podcast, didn't you, Gavin, recently? I think that was some, you got some really interesting insights to what's going on there, especially in, in terms of the fact that, like, we can say that there is a, you know, that the uh, progressive wing of the church is in ascendancy or that we're watching the Catholics follow down that, Episcopal synodal route, but that is not the case because it doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter, you know, who's like if the Pope is coming out of all this rubbish. It doesn't change the magisterium if you can't reconcile your statements with, you know, what the Church has always taught from a Catholic point of view. It bears no weight, and it will it will it just end up being absolutely pointless. And there are a growing number of cardinals in Rome who are aware of this. But rather than have a very public disagreement, it seems that they are much more content. They're, go they're just doing this at the moment, boys. They're going, right, OK, how much longer? You know, we'll have a new pope in another few years, won't we? And then it'll all be, we'll see what happens at the conclave, you know? And then all this, I, I, I do believe, I mean, I don't know if you bothered reading any of Francis's stuff, but it's absolute rubbish. 
self-referential, you know, that like there's no magisterial or very few magisterial references. It literally is, as Pope Benedict would have said, the hermeneutic of rupture. Francis is literally trying to say that a new church was created in the 60s. And it's just not going to wash because Catholics won't put up with it. Well, I would say that Francis is the first uh, virtual signaling pope. Hmm. Okay, what he says, he says, for the effect of the world to hear that what he is doing, what the Roman Catholic Church is doing, um, is not just for religious purposes, but for secular purposes as well. Whether it's climate change, whether it's economy, whether it's local politics in Italy, uh, or international politics, Pope Francis, as well as Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, are willing to uh, put their voice out there. This but when it comes to moment. really, Sorry, when it comes to a really important issue, like a, a person being arrested for praying in a no pray zone in Britain, or a, a, you know, a people being persecuted uh, around the world, uh, they're not there to say a word. Well said, Kevin. What an absolute scandal that is, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to uh, say that, that in terms of in terms of justifying what's been said, uh, one of the most powerful voices is Cardinal Pell, uh, and he's died a few days ago, and he left a memo, in the, uh, apparently anonymous, under the name of Demos, which he sent to the other cardinals to help them get their act together when it comes to replace a new pope. And he called, he called Francis's pontificate disastrous, and explained why, um, you know, all the, particularly the ambiguity, the lack of justice, um, and the lack of the lack of orthodoxy. Um, people thought it might be Pell, but they weren't sure. But 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 it was, and it stands, I think, as a because Pell was also a very competent intellectual, uh, public intellectual, and theologian. He was, a, he was a very brave man, completely innocent of the charges laid against him to trap him and deprive him of his work in, in uh, getting rid of corruption in the Vatican. And and he's left us with one of the most powerful uh, testimonials as to the flakiness of the present pontificate. It hurts Catholics greatly to talk badly about the Pope. Um, I, I, you know, and, and we try not to do it. But at the same time, there is this responsibility, as Pell showed us, that we have to make a distinction between the office and the way the office is delivered. It's been delivered very badly, and we're looking for it to be delivered well soon. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Uh, Catherine, uh, Pope Benedict spoke about consumerism. Not a fan. Now, I say this as I'm looking at my Mac Airbook, multi-thousand dollar uh, unit, my microphone, my my lights, my ear pods, my RV. I'm a consumerist. And he thought that consumerism was going to make it difficult for people to follow uh, certainly Roman Catholicism, but any spirituality, because the consumerism itself was a religion. What, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> um, well, I, my, first, my first thought is you've got a far more expensive computer than I have. Um, yeah. um, Pope, Fran uh, P Pope Benedict, uh, I, I suppose what the, the thing is, it's not, it's about what you idolize, isn't it? It's not about the fact that you have wealth. It's about how much you attach, how you attach to that wealth. So I think he was quite right that we increasingly find ourselves uh, tempted uh, and and attached to worldly things. Um, but but the answer isn't well. We don't want to cross sort of. In, into politics, but the answer isn't to throw everything away and um, uh, and all be impoverished. It's it's to it's to say, well, we we have to have our eyes fixed on Christ, and that's the centre of everything. And, and everything is relative to Christ. Um, and as long as we don't attach too much importance to material things, then and, and to consuming things, then. Then, then we, you know, we we will be in on good ground. But I, but what I think is we we're, we're talking about different popes. We're saying Pope Benedict and Pope Francis, and obviously we will do that. But I also want to to say that 
we have this tradition, this um, this consistency, and sometimes it's tempting to say, well, Francis has come along and he's the Pope who talks about the environment and Benedict spoke about uh, uh, life issues. And in fact, whilst one might emphasise one area over the other, uh, what we can do is say that uh, we receive this deposit of faith and, and all popes have spoken in, in defence of life and, and the beauty of creation. But one may emphasise perhaps more that over the other. But there is that that um, consistency between between them as well. One of the things that in covering Justin Welby ever since he took office, Justin Welby has a bad habit of saying things to the audience that they want to hear. So when he would speak in Africa and Nairobi, he would say things to the African bishops that just pushed all the right buttons for them. But then he goes back to the UK and speaks to a student group or a liberal group or at this green belt stuff, and he is as whacked out as they come. And I hate to compare anybody to Justin Welby, but Francis, in my experience, is a lot like that. He's it, He is a weather vane in the sense that he's more, in my outsider's perspective, he's interested in the pursuit of power rather than the pursuit of truth. Power in the sense of having the mob, the masses, follow him wherever he may be, rather than speaking to an eternal, unchanging truth, uh, whether it's popular or not. Now, it's a harsh statement, and I uh, will stand to be corrected by Gavin, who has no problem doing that, uh, correcting me. Which is but, good. Uh, like that. Yeah, which which is good. I agree but, with you, George. <laughs> but, the, but, you know, it's the pursuit of power that I see is the destruction of the Church of England hierarchy that has destroyed the American hierarchy at the Episcopal Church. And I, and I just see so much of it in my limited reading of the Catholic world. I see the same <clears throat> attitudes, the same prince bishops, uh, you know, who seek to consolidate their team, their club, their followers, their people, the Cardinal McCarricks who build an empire of like-minded, like-oriented people who have nothing to do with the eternal salvation and found in Jesus Christ, but about perpetuating uh, the in-group's power. Um, that's there. I've just damned yeah, well, all religious leaders. How's well, the, that? Uh, the, the, let's the throw the Dalai Lama in too while we're at it. Just uh, you know, the gates of hell. Man needs a new prevail. tailor. But, uh. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church, George. But we we've, we've got. Um, I think it's interesting to point out Pope Francis and his uh, the the way you, you you spoke about his emphasis, and we've spoken, haven't we, Mark and Gavin, about Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, and what he did was. Um, he pointed to the transcendent using symbols and things it, like his red shoes and his stole. And um, Pope Francis came along and wanted to present this idea of simplicity and look at my simple white robe and I and I and I stay in a simple palace, a simple palace in a in a, in a, a simple apartment. And I pay for my own meals and I'm really humble. And in fact, in doing that, in highlighting himself, what he was doing was the opposite, which is what you're saying. It was it was pointing to himself and not to the transcendent. So the very things that people said Pope Benedict was doing, which were pompous and and um, uh, distanced him, him from ordinary people, were in fact humble. It was him t in all humility saying it's not about me, the man. It's about I. It's about me directing you towards Christ, and so what Pope Francis does, people see as a great man of humility and doing all these wonderful, simple things, is in fact the very opposite. It's saying, actually, look at me. It's about me and how humble I am. So, yes, I can see, I can see what you're saying there. There, there, there is a, an, a problem. I think what's extraordinary is the way that the press have ignored. Like you know, they would they jumped on Pope Benedict for any little thing that he said and we see this all the time don't we you know like it's like with the 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 gay blessings or whatever you know that they're like the the press in the uk are all attacking the church of england at the moment for standing up for the faith you know and we saw that throughout benedict's papacy they hated him the vitriol that was thrown at him when he came and visited the uk over here was just extraordinary um but the result but the 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 way that it was responded to consistently was with love and you see the, the reverse taking place with Pope Francis, that the press don't seem to be interested in any of the controversy. 
there are loads of documented, uh, you know, situations going on where you've got, um, you know, really scandalous uh, investments and and fraud going on in the Vatican Bank. That's ongoing. It's meant to be like the, uh, you know, the crime of the century or whatever. Never see it reported in the press. Cardinal got, then uh, hung out to dry. Yeah, exactly. Which was all part of what happened to yeah. Cardinal Pell. You, and they jumped on Pell and you sort of had a go at him, you know, paedophilia. It was all nonsense. If you only had to read the charges to see, uh, you know, you know, George, how any how a, a cardinal could abuse two children in the sacristy of the, the of the cathedral after mass is just in full vestments. It's just absolutely ridiculous. Um, but then, like, the other thing is you've got, like, Zanchi, you've got all these perverts that Francis is... Uh, supporting, hiding, promoting, making bishops, all this sort of nonsense going on. And you never hear any of it reported. It's all he can do whatever he likes. And it's exactly what you say. It's like the world, isn't it? It's like the, you know, the sea of politics. Or you know, It's extraordinary. There's definitely a supernatural dimension to it that the world, they love Francis. You know, the, and if the world loves him, there's a serious problem there. And what have you got with Benedict? Completely the opposite. You've got someone who's quiet, humble, loves Christ, you know, he's talking about Jesus, he's making sense, he's affecting uh, important people, influential people in the world with the gospel message, with the charisma, and he's attacked. That, I mean, doesn't that make sense spiritually oh, for all of us? Yeah. But hold on, but Mark, you didn't smile enough. Yeah, I know, yeah, I know. Yeah, he just... And he was yeah, German, actually, he Fran uh, Benedict smiled much more than Francis. It, it Francis is never, always gloom in all the photos. I remember one of the first oh. reports I saw, maybe 2007 or eight. Uh, not first reports, but many reports I saw on Pope Benedict. Well, I don't think he smiles enough. He just doesn't have that demeanor that a Pope should have. And I'm like, okay, you know, and... But this is one of the things I think about uh, the way Pope Benedict was described and everyone said he's so dogmatic. And I think, well, actually, dogma matters. You know, it, you 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 need to care about dogma before you can then uh, respect the dignity of, of, of man, respect the dignity of one another, love one another. That actually people seem to think it's an either or. You either are loving and kind and, and progressive and welcome everyone under the big tent um, and get rid of dogma or you're dogmatic and you don't care about people. And so Benedict, as Gavin said, had this 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 sort of wonderful balance of both head and heart, this compassion for, uh, for man, but this love of truth. So we need to be dogmatic. We need to well, not... We saw, the, we saw the same thing as well. We saw the same thing with Pell, didn't we? And uh, your podcast brought that out with Edward, because Edward Pentin knew him really well. Now, mm. Pell, he, he loved England. He was a bit of an Anglophile. And I had the privilege of meeting him in 2014 at Buckfast Abbey. And I had a few, like, it was a casual, he was there for a, an official engagement, but I actually sat in the pub and had a couple of pints with him. And he was just one of those people that, you know, when you meet someone and immediately you can see the sparkle of intelligence in their eyes. He, you know, he really was a man of Christ. He believed the faith and he was absolutely confident in defending it, you know? And so you, you People like that are just of immense value to the church, and I think Benedict was of the same. Age. What would, would you? What, what was your take from what Edward was saying, Gavin? Did you? Well, I want to back up what what Kevin and George and you are saying, and that is that we're dealing with a spiritual dimension, and effectively, the more the more authentic and holy and Christian and determined follower of Jesus somebody is, the more the press will misrepresent them uh, and give them a really hard time, and that's what we saw with Pell and with Benedict. And I, I mean, Francis, of course, there are good bits to him. I mean, he's done, he, he, he certainly did a very good job at making, through the good offices of the press, at making the Catholic Church seem a friendlier place. And if, if he'd been able to carry that through with changes of substance, that would have been a virtuous way of of doing some evangelizing. The problem is that the behind this quite quite a, this this sophisticated approach he has with the press. Um, the 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 underbelly of it all has has been problematic. It's been corrupt. It's been, as Catherine said, all the opposite of what he's presented. The fact that the press likes his um, his public statements ought to give us ought to make us stop and be, and be a bit shocked. You know, this "Who am I to judge?" thing was terribly clever of him. Really, really clever, capturing the zeitgeist, but absolutely disastrous in terms 
of the fact that he seems to want to 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 um, to give preferential treatment to uh, to to the to the gay mafia lobby and doesn't have a problem with 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 the paedophile clergy who ought to be held to account in the most robust and vigorous way. That's that's the most terrible scandal. And as Mark has said, the press don't care because they buy the who am I to judge stuff. And he buys like as careful. homosexuality, isn't he? Which is sort of, or he, you know, all right, listen, he, he appears to be, or he speaks out, I think Catholics feel that he speaks out of both sides of his mouth. You know, he says, you get these official pronouncements, for example, you know, very um, pertinent with the, the um, blessing of gay, I don't know, whatever it is, gay marriages, whatever. No, it's not gay marriages, it's, they, well, they're blessed anyway now in Anglican churches. <laughs> but, like, you know, we just had the, the congregation of the doctor in the face saying that that can't happen. But Francis is absent from all of that sort of shenanigans. And I was going to say, when I, when I met Pell in Buckfast, he stood up and addressed all these things and said, you know, we as Christians, and this, I think this is important for all of us, you know, if we don't take these arguments into the public sphere um, and actually have a coherent response, if it, you know, then we look like what they call, you know, we look like homophobes or we look like, because, I mean, I was reading um, John Inge. I think my friends have been following, I've been sort of having a bit of a Twitter to and fro with uh, John Inge, who's the Bishop of Worcester, isn't it, Gavin? Is yeah. it Worcester? And, you know, I mean, yeah. like he's one of the sort of cheerleaders for this uh, gay marriage thing in the Church of England. And, you know, I have to say, guys, is what he's saying, I'm sure you'd agree with me as well, um, if you read his open letter that he wrote about it, it's completely incoherent in terms of Christian doctrine. And to have a, a Christian, a man calling himself a bishop, who, you know, surely the job, our job as Christians is to stand up and to explain why these teachings are important you know historically this has always been the teaching of the church and it's the teaching of the church for a reason it's not homophobic it's not because we're frightened or because we're we hate anyone or that's absolute nonsense um and i i actually tweeted him benedict the 16th when he was the uh, the head of the cdf wrote a brilliant document on the pastoral care of persons with homosexual tendencies and i i sent that to him and i copied in ian paul who's another um, prominent sort of uh, more on the evangelical side over here, a really clever guy who I really respect. And uh, he, you know, he's, he was, there was quite a few Anglicans who were quite impressed with that document that um, Ratzinger had written, you know, because it's very coherent and it it's very scriptural and it's, you know, it just says, look, this is the, this is what the, the Christian position is on homosexual relationships. And we must be careful to treat those people with absolute love and respect um, but let's not try and equate it with um, marriage because that's not, you know, it's it's a different thing. And if you're if you if you're getting the two things mixed up, then you know you you're kind of going off track a little bit, aren't you? Well, that's a bit part of the seamless garment thing that we've seen in 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 the church. This this way of thinking, which is really dangerous, which is to equate everything uh, to put to put um, uh, the preeminence of human life. Uh, issues about abortion on the same level as the environment. Um, and it's not that one is more true than the other, that it doesn't matter about the environment, but that there is that, that there are some moral questions that where there's scope for prudential judgment and some where there just aren't, where it's just absolute. And so the question of abortion is is absolute. And with the LGBTQ plus, what I'm not entirely sure what that means, but with that lobby, we we we're try there's a there's an attempt to kind of um say that homosexual acts and it's not persons of course it's acts as pope benedict said we should always be uh, in intransigent with sin and indulgent with the sinner uh, there's an attempt to in include homosexual acts amongst sort of general sexual sins like adultery um but they are different they cry out to heaven in a different way uh, it's it's waging war against nature itself it's uh, it's waging war against the complementarity of the sexes it's not about the person we, that there is we live in a fallen world but to say that it's no different to let's say adultery and the problem is that they're not married then opens up the door to saying well let's just allow homosexual couples to be married but it's of a different order and so there's a real problem there, I think, with with this equating of 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 these sins. Kevin may remember this, but when 
Amy Coney Barrett was uh, being questioned when she joined the U.S. Supreme Court. Dianne Feinstein, who happens to be a Roman Catholic senator from uh, California, said to her, the dogma lives loud in you, yeah. uh, Judge Barrett. And why, why I raise that up is that we use words like dogma and these truths, but for the for the secular world, for the great amorphous, you know, chattering classes that are out there, all these things that we're talking about are reprehensible. How dare we stand on a dogma that uh, basically repudiates uh, their cherished beliefs? Um, you, know, you raised Bishop Inch. Um, he re recently remarried, and he married a woman who has a living husband. And 10 years ago, that that couldn't happen because you know the Church of England would refuse to allow divorced bishops and or bishops to marry uh, women uh, who have been divorced and with uh, living husbands. And my best friend George when he became my, the bishop, my, my best friend is an Anglican who um, he wanted to get married, and his wife had been she was a Jehovah's Witness who had uh, been divorced, who was married in a secular uh, service, and she was divorced from him. So, I mean, in a Catholic church, that would, you know, there was no marriage contracted because neither of them were baptized persons. And yet she was refused, like he was refused in his Anglican parish because she was divorced and remarried as they saw it. And, you know, he sort of came to me and said, and I said, well, you can get married in our I said, it's absolute, doesn't make any sense at all. And now you've got this situation where bishops are, it, it's crazy, isn't it? You know? It, because, in other words, a standard that when I started out, um, well, there's well, there are lots of wonderful jokes about the Episcopal Church, and Gavin has heard all of them that I've told over the years. But one of my classmates in seminary is a priest in good standing in the Diocese of California in the city of San Francisco, who was on her fifth marriage. In my diocese, if you uh, if you uh, leave your wife to marry your secretary, the bishop will say, pursue your vocation to be a taxi driver. There's no, you know, it, it ethics and morals depends upon geography in the Anglican world. And it's that's now seems to be the case in England. I mean, what is sin in Africa and in the swamps here in Florida is now called blessed and good, and we will ask the Lord to bless these things. But um, it's not just... Which, um... It's not just a, a slipping of relativistic values. Though. Obviously, it is that. Um, but I, I've just written an article. I don't want to be too self-referential like, like Pope Francis. But but <laughs> as as I tried to address the, the church, what the Church of England has done over gay blessings, it occurred to me that, uh, that what's going on is is a, a repudiation of holiness in the holiness code within Judeo-Christianity and a replacement with a different kind of holiness. And the reason why the progressives get very cross with us is because we're blaspheming against their holiness. Now, what is holy for them? Mm -hmm. Holiness for them is the integrity of the erotic and the amorous relationship, the making of a person happy with somebody else. That's become the the the, the supreme value against which nobody must blaspheme. And so when we say you must have you must renounce some of the things you want to have, you must sacrifice these things that you want, for them we are we're actually attacking their God. It's a form of idolatry. And so the, the, the one of the things I think we need to do as 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 Orthodox Christians is to say at the heart of this is is a redefining of of holiness and sin. And so for the progressives, holiness is self-indulgence in an amorous and erotic context, and sin is criticizing it. Um, but and so I, and I think I think we need to recognize that we have two two systems of thought that are an utter contradistinction to each other. And although it is relativization, it's much more than that. It's a it's a very serious ideological conflict. Well, I don't I think know if you're was... from... Go on, sorry, Kim, well, I was I... gonna say, I don't know if you know of the, the Fatima. Um, I don't know if you, Our Lady of Fatima, you know, Our Lady appeared to three children at Fatima and Our Lady said that, um, you know, the, the, the final battle would be over family and marriage. And, I've, you know, you see it now forming. And our, none of our Christian leaders, we're, you know, we're in the same boat here where um, you've got, none of them seem to be able to articulate the importance of, um, Christian marriage, you know, why it's important to protect children, to protect 
wives and you know like that it just seems to be completely absent from their narrative they want to talk about climate change and uh you know reparation for slavery and you whatever woke nonsense comes across their desk and no one seems to be able to articulate the fundamental truths of our faith they, they don't, just can't articulate they just don't know the uh absolute importance of it uh last year's most important thing was code red for climate change you know we are code red we need to do everything put every resource we can uh could we block the sun what could we do to stop climate change yeah. where in reality we live in a, in a society right now where we have redefined everything there's a new definition for everything whether it be something simple like female or male or marriage um God, civilization, our responsibility within it uh, has all been redefined. Civics has been redefined. What does it mean to be a citizen in America? Well, right now, if you've been raised in a public education, it means you you pretty much hate your country. You hate your leaders, and you've been taught to hate everything conservative. You've been brought up in you know some type of 60s sex cult if you've gone to public school. And... So we've lost our message as Christians. We've lost that battle for now. How do we re-ascertain, certainly through uh, some of the, the wonderful teachings by uh, Pope Benedict, but how do we re-establish and re-message that? Because it's looking really bad for us. Gavin, yeah, as, a, as a young boy in the 60s, you went to an Anglican boarding school. Would you consider that a and a 60 sex cult, the uh, uh, upbringing you received. You know, we've been talking about uh, single sex. Oh, that fell flat, didn't it, Gavin? Come on, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, George, I took it seriously. <laughs> did, did I miss I missed the ball? Sorry, George. No, sorry, sorry. <laughs> oh, but, but, but go ahead. I was going to say that the, one of the one of the things that happened in my education was it was single sex. Uh, I, I'm incredibly grateful that, that as a as a testosterone filled a, a adolescent with a, 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 a wild and problematic imagination that I was educated a, a, amongst boys and and didn't have the opportunity for messing up a whole load of adolescent girls' life with my pestering immature attention. Um, and some people will say, well, that that was a piece of of, uh, of brainwashing that has made you a misogynistic old man. It actually wasn't at all. It was part. It was part of the fact that the Christian culture understood that took our sexuality very seriously, and placed us in places where it, it could be held and harnessed and disciplined. And I would say, if we one of the things that's happened to us is that our secular society has become addicted to sex. I mean, completely addicted to it, and has no restraint, no no capacity to to harness it, to hold it, to rebuke it, to rechannel it. Um, I'm I'm very glad that I grew up in a period where where Christian culture helped us understand the reality of fallen humanity, uh, and to give us a sense of reassessing how we might manage our relationships with the other sex. I think it's better. It was better then than it is today. You, you said I think been... cold showers and short pants also helped uh, <laughs> contain your <laughs> list. But, uh... I was saying, Kevin, you, you say about um, uh, that, uh, that we've lost sight of truth, and indeed it's true, and where do we go and what do we do? And I would say that uh, although it's bleak, and it certainly seems that way, um, that young people are really, really thirsty for truth they hunger for it they really do and they recognize it as well and so i think that's why it's so important to do small things like the things we're doing now and for people to continue to speak truth with charity in the culture um because i i'm convinced that that people i myself w was it was only through meeting people who were really authentic who really lived what they believed tried to were striving for holiness and were not afraid um and was were, were countercultural that that really is so attractive and so i think i think there's there's an incoherence in a lot of what we're seeing you know that the the we talked about the the lgbt the the trans ideology 
um, truth is always consistent and harmonious. And I think with a lot of that narrative, that's how you can see that it's it's at the root of it is lies about who we are, um, about our nature. Uh, and uh, on the one hand, gay people can't change, and on the other, uh, people with gender dysphoria must change. So there's an in, there's an there's an interior incoherence in the narrative and i think ultimately that will be exposed and and what pope benedict was brilliant at doing was exposing that in charity so my hope is that as things go darker get darker the light will shine brighter and people will come to see the incoherence of it the the, the sad thing is and what we must pray about is the damage that's caused in the meantime and there's great damage being caused in the meantime but i think um people recognize truth and 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 it's so important that we we keep speaking truth no, in the but we're we're not because right now the the truth the culture the zeitgeist of the day is pride is the solution to shame you know pride pride will heal your shame and uh we as but a it church does, they all commit suicide that, well no, this is, uh, that's the reality of it so yeah at some point they're going to work it out you know, like, and I was chatting with the, the Latin Mass Society in, in London yesterday. I had a meeting with the guys there, and they were saying, we were talking about um, social media, and they were saying that on Facebook, their demographic is under 30. You know, and Facebook is seen to be an older demographic, isn't it? It's supposed to be like us old people all go on Facebook and have a chat. But they... And, well, obviously, not you, Catherine. Um, and then uh, we went to uh, you didn't go to the, the mass that um Lawrence Lou did at Corpus Christi, did you, Catherine? So no, we got this no. all right. So do you know do you know about Corpus Christi? It's the, the shrine of the Blessed Sacrament in Covent Garden in London. I went there when Cardinal Sarah was there. That's it, right? Okay, yeah. so there was a mass there with uh, they like they do have special liturgies. Seriously, guys, look it up on the internet, right? Corpus Christi Maiden Lane. In Covent Garden in London, it's it's like the inside of a tabernacle. The church is like the inside of a tabernacle. It's absolutely beautiful. Anyway, the point was that we had this mass there, and it was uh, like in the Dominican rite. So it was like an old form of Latin mass, and uh, it was we. I, like, I went there with a friend. It was absolutely packed full of young men. Yeah, you know, seventy thirty. I'd say everyone sort of under thirty. And everyone reverently following the mass, bowing at the name of Jesus, you know. And it, and these guys, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for coherent answers to yeah. the challenges of secular society. And the church, we know that Christianity provides those answers. The, the, if we fail to articulate them properly, that's what we're, the problem that we've got is that our bishops, Anglican and Catholic bishops, are failing to articulate. They're trying to chase you know, the secular narrative in order to sort of attract people to them. or what, They haven't got a clue. What yeah. works is what has always worked, and that is to proclaim Christ, you know, resurrected and uh, that we are created, that we are loved and we are redeemed. And that's what has always worked, and that's what will always work. And they need to wake up to that. Yeah. Day. It's one thing to bring people in, but where do you take them? You know, Jesus didn't say to the woman caught in adultery, uh, go, Yeah, you're all right. <laughs> you're all right, love. Carry on. Uh, catch her next week. Uh, go and sin no more. So it's a bit, it's not, I think sometimes people mistake when you try to speak uh, the truth and 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 you you try and draw people towards towards truth, towards towards Christ, is that you're, you're being judgmental. And as you say, uh, Pope Benedict says, uh, sorry, sorry, Pope Francis says, uh, who am I to judge? But of course, we have to judge actions, and we do all the time. It doesn't mean we judge people's eternal souls. That's not my business. That's God's. But we have to judge actions. Uh, we're called to do that. Any good parent knows that. Was that what George was saying earlier on about the the way that Benedict sort of drew the two, you know, was drawing the two uh, traditions together, if you like, or, you know, was much more ecumenical in the way that... And like, I've built up a, a really good relationship with a local evangelical church. And I've and I, I wonder how you'd speak to this, George. Like what I kind of find is that all those old uh ideas have, have lost in this generation. You know, no one's looking back and saying, you know, where the schism was or where people what it is is that a lot of these people, a lot of the evangelicals I meet, they have encountered Christ in some way. 
and they're passionate for Jesus. Yeah. And that's what they're looking for. They're looking for more Jesus, you know, and they don't care about the divisions, the old divisions that perhaps some of us, you know, uh, understood or grew up with. And what they're looking for is a, what is like a mo more co coherent kerygma, a more coherent expression of the good news. And where they hear that message, that's where they follow. And that's what we need to get busy about, all of us, is preaching the gospel and forget about all the other rubbish. It doesn't matter, does it? If yeah. we're bringing people to Christ, that's the most important element. Well, that, that's why Ian Paisley Jr. went into politics, not into the Presbyterian ministry. There wasn't any money in beating up on Catholics in Ulster anymore. <laughs> um, I wanted to uh, sort of slide over and get your thoughts about the most important religion story in the past two weeks in Britain. Uh, and it does have an American angle. And uh, it's uh, Jeremy Clarkson and Meghan Markle and Harry uh, refusing to accept an apology and the whole CRT wokeness that you can never be redeemed, you're always damned. Do you know what I'm talking about? The, yeah. Um, where he said uh, some really obnoxious things, but he always says obnoxious things. There wasn't a surprise there. And then when it came, when he offered an apology, it was rejected. And, you know, there is no forgiveness from the woke. You are all, You can only be damned. You can never come back. And I think that's the most profoundly religious story of the past few days. You know, at the end of the day, who really cares what the Church of England is going to do? I care because I write about it and uh, and I get people excited about it in Africa. But at the end of the day, more people in the streets will basically be asking themselves, why can't, you know, the gospel of Jesus Christ be lived out by people who should know better? who, after all, Justin Welby did catechize Meghan Markle, and I, he did such a good job uh, preparing her to be an Anglican. Uh, are well, you guys think, allowed to talk to that, or will the police come and arrest you for being unkind uh, well, I would, in Britain? One thing I'd add to that is the church is not really modeling forgiveness well either. No. You know, <laughs> it, it, you know so... Jane O'Zane, who is the one of the leaders of the gay lobby in the Church of England, has basically been saying that everybody who's held the traditional 2,000-year views of Christianity must be driven out of the church. You must leave because your very presence is dangerous to us. All right. Well, Catherine, you were talking about judgment uh, a couple minutes ago. I am being judged because I have to. Do Nobody something. likes Harry and Megan. Oh, we, we're we're keeping it high and uh, dry, yeah. aren't we? Oh yeah, my! Well, that, that's I just think right. everyone here, no one cares in England. Yeah. Like everyone, no, it's it's also, windy, yeah, it's all it. just rubbish. <laughs> and I, I think there's a lot more attention given to it in the US than there is in England. Like yeah. every, I mean, like it's sort of carte blanche on the media over here that everyone just can't bear it. No. No, no, yeah. but no, no, you you turn all the women's magazines, all the the talk chat shows. Yeah, they're all trying to know, make money. I guess it. they've got to fill. Well, they got to fill. They have to fill space too. You need content for these shows. But man, a lot. It just was such a religious topic that nobody seemed to pick up the religious angle to it. Well, you just had three unpleasant friends. people being mean to each other. Both of my friends here have written about it. I'm going to shut up, and they can tell you because they've both written about it. Come on, guys. <laughs> well, I mean, I I think it's it's just indicative of this. You say woke. Um, it's they were this idea that um, we're terrible people like us who speak of truth and um, who say we are all called to holiness and and it doesn't mean that we say we're holy or perfect, but that we at least recognise there's an aim that there's something to aim towards, um, and uh, then these you know this this sort of mob who say if you say the wrong thing if you're if you're if you've if you've written the wrong thing 45 years ago we'll dig it out we'll find it we'll hold it against you and we'll you know your life will be over your life will be ruined so it's on it, the, the the thing that i think is is it's frustrating is that on the one hand it's presented as this we're nice we're caring we're compassionate you're horrible and you're dogmatic and you're you talk about truth and we're the nice ones but as soon as you say anything that that they disapprove of it's curtains whereas actually what what i think we're able to say as christians is 
there is truth. We do believe that certain things are right and wrong, but we're not saying that we're perfect. We're saying that it's because we're not perfect that we need that and that we... And the truth will set you free. And the truth will set you free, yeah. Yeah. I think Kevin right, guys. I, 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 I need to, to wrap this up. Yep. Uh, I have a hot date. <laughs> well, this is <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and so uh, I, I do need to, to, to roll. Uh, thank you guys for gathering together for uh, our uh, conversation on Unscripted. And uh, I'm certainly glad we could talk uh, so faithfully about uh, uh, Pope Benedict and the legacy he leads behind and hopefully future doctor of the church. Really enjoyed it. Cheers. Thanks very much. Big waves. Big waves. (laughs) God bless. Bye-bye. Bye.